Hi everyone, I'm Jody Barrows with The Square in a Square. Welcome to our summer webinar today of 2022. I'm so excited to teach what I'm going to show you today because it will really open up the whole piecing world to you. When you start seeing how shapes and colors can help create designs and how simple and easy it is to create any quilt that you want to make with the square in a square system. Now we're just going to cover a few of the options today. There are 41 options with the square in a square system. That means that option 1, option 4, option 12, option 39, all of these are different triangle shapes that you get with one simple method we call the square in a square. And you have basically have one tool that creates all of these different units and you can make them any size that you want. So square in a squares, flying geese, half square triangles, all of these different shapes, option one through option 41, can be made with one simple tool and basically starting out with what we call the basic square. Now I don't teach how to make the basic square very often, but there are some videos out there where you can see it. We have a very fast chain piecing method where we start out with a long strip and we start putting our squares on top of it and then cutting them up and sewing more strips on until we get a square with four strips on the side. Now we call these surround strips because with the square and a square system, everything starts out with this square in the middle and you surround it with your strips and then you use the, the tool to trim it up to get all of these triangle shapes. And what the system does is it helps give you speed and accuracy, but it, the science behind it is that it helps remove the human element. So the human element of piecing a block or a quilt and putting it together is the cutting of the pieces, the sewing of the pieces, and the pressing. So when you really go back and look at what happens when the human does all of these different things, you can see where people run into problems where they lose their accuracy or how people do it, how they get more perfection, more speed, and more ability. So the square to square system is a system that makes triangle units, makes them any size, and all of these different shapes, and then you put them together to build beautiful blocks and beautiful quilts like you see here behind me. There are very few quilts out there in the quilt world that I have seen that cannot be made with the square in a square system. Now remember, although the name of the system is square in a square, what you're going to get is triangle units, and these triangle units are in a square. So sometimes, uh, just here lately, a lady sent me a pattern of a quilt, and it was just squares and rectangles, and she said, can you do this with the square in a square system? There were no triangle units in it anywhere, so you didn't need the square in a square system to make it. Now, we also do what we call the science of patchwork. And the science of patchwork is when you are working with just squares or rectangles or other things, how can I take the science of what I'm doing and learn where I need to improve on that human element of the cutting, sewing, and pressing. So with the square and a square system, which is the tool and the triangle units, and with the, the science of patchwork, you can become a better piecer and make those quilts that you've always dreamed of. So let's get into the system. We have a lot that we're gonna to cover today. Get your drink and you can go back and watch this over again because I'm gonna give you a lot of information. But with what I'm going to give you today, you, you can take what you learn here and you can look at most any pattern out there and adapt it over to the square and the square system. Now also remember, anytime, no matter what you're working on, if you have questions and you need help, we have a quilting hotline. And that quilting hotline, you can text to it. It is 817-713-2879. Now the thing that I love about when you text me something and you ask me a question is right there in that same format, I can make a video for you, either showing you in the book where to get the information that you need or whatever it is that you're needing help with, I can do a quick little video and send it to you right there on that text line. And it's so easy and quick to do. So make sure you write that number down, 817-713-2879. There is no reason with the technology that we have today um, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't struggle with anything. We're here to help 
just give us a text and we'll throw you a lifeline and we'll get you started down that patchwork path of beautiful quilts. Okay, so let's look down here at our table first. When I have so much to tell you, I'm always kind of like, okay, where do I start? So this is the most simple for you to understand and to soak up. So before we actually get started in um, cutting our different shapes and into the work, I want to show you the three uh, rulers that are the square and a square rulers. Now we actually have six tools that are um, in our arsenal that we use. We have the four patch and the nine patch and the binding tool and um, uh, we may show you some of that today. We'll just see how our time goes along. But these are the three main square in a square rulers. This is the first one here, and it's what we call the original. And this is the one that I've had for over 30 years. Now this one cuts every shape. It cuts every option. So the, when you're just getting started, this is usually the one that we recommend that you get started with. So everything I'm going to show you today, you can do with this one right here. Everything I'm going to show you today, you can do with what we call the mini. The mini is like the larger one, but when you're working in a small space or you're working with, you know, average pieces, this one could be a little bit more convenient to work with than the large one. Now, the other thing that I love, love, love about the mini ruler is it has this four inch corner square. And I use it to um, cut squares, to trim up units, to you know, check four patches, whatever. This little four inch corner square um, is, I use it every time I'm working on a project. And then of course you have your angles on here that are the same angles here that you use to create your square and square units. Then two years ago, I made the Grande. We had people requesting a larger ruler when you, when you start sewing around your shape multiple times or you have some really big ones, then the original will work but you'll, you have to butt another ruler up next to it. So we made the grande so that it was bigger to cut some of the larger shapes. You don't have to have it, but it is nice to use. So every time I design a ruler, I don't want it to do just one thing or three things. I want it to do what I say, load the dishwasher and put supper on the table, or I don't want to make a ruler. I don't want one ruler that only does one shape or only does one size. I want tools that have multiple purposes, but also are clean and neat and easy to read. So the Grande, the multi-purpose ruler, has lots of different things it'll do, and there's a great video on our website, squareandsquare.com, that you can go in and watch and see how to use this tool for all of those different things. Obviously, it'll cut your squares and it'll cut your strips. So it'll get you started here in making your basic square for the system. Then we also added a, um, red line here that helps you cut the diamonds. So some of our options start out with a square in the middle and some of our di um, options start out with a diamond in the middle. So let me see if I have a little diamond here. Okay, so here you can see how we have a diamond shape in the middle and the surround strips on it, just like we had the square in the middle and the surround strips on it. So cutting this diamond is, um, is once you learn how to do it, obviously it's not uh, difficult, and we, we, have, we did it for years with just the original, but people wanted a quicker, easier way to cut the diamond shape. So when I made the, the Grande, I put this red line on it right here, so it helps you cut that center diamond better. Now when you get ready to start trimming up your diamond shape, so just like we're gonna take this square today and trim it up to get a lot of different shapes like you see here, you can take this diamond and trim it up to get lots of different shapes, which we're not going into that today. But to do the trimming after the diamond is cut, you have to go back and use the uh, original or the mini. This one does not actually trim the basic diamond, okay? All right, so go to our website, squareandsquare.com. You can see all the different um, things that you can do with the, the Grande Multipurpose. I love it, I use it. I use all three of these uh, tools equally. But if you're just getting one and you're just getting started, then start out with the original, okay? 
And you can go in and text questions anytime you want, um, and we'll get to those. And if we don't get to them here in the video, we'll get to you um, later if that's a question that we missed or something somehow, okay? All right, so we're gonna start out trimming, uh, looking at the basic square. I'm gonna try to give you tips and hints to help make it as accurate as you can. And then we're gonna start right in with the trimming of it, okay? So here is a large one. And you can make your basic squares any size you want. Now, obviously, if you're following our patterns and our books, we're gonna tell you what size of square, what color, what size, we're gonna give you all of that in the patterns. If you're kind of doing your own thing, then you're gonna be able to go to the charts in the book. So we have um, a reference book that is for the square and a reference book that's for the diamond. So this is your um, reference book for the diamond and for the square, it's going to look like this. So in your books, you've got patterns, just like, you know, telling you what to cut and what size and how to sew and all that. Over 30 patterns, you've got over 50 different block sizes, but you also have your um, charts. And so your charts are what you use when you're looking at, at you know, say you saw a picture of a block on Facebook and you're like, oh, I want to make that. Well, you're going to use your charts to figure out the sizes that you need, okay? And that's the pattern adapting part. And it's going to tell you what size of square and what size of strips. So as we go along today, we're going to talk about how to do that. But I want you to know before we get started with the cutting and with the pattern adapting part, that there are two there's three things that you need to know before you jump into the deep end of the, of the swimming pool of doing the pattern adapting. And um, if you don't know those or understand those, then it's going to be hard. You're going to be gulping for air and getting water up your nose because, you know, you need to learn to swim in the shallow water and get your face wet before you jump in off that diving board and go completely under, okay? So although we're gonna go into this pattern adapting part, we're gonna keep it simple, but there's a couple of things that you need to know first before you jump into the deep water, okay? The first thing is, is you need to understand the square and a square system. If you're trying to learn the ruler and learn what an option three is and what an option four is and how to use the ruler to trim up flying geese or half square triangles, that is gonna be difficult for you to go in and do the pattern adapting. So the first thing you need to know is you need to know the basic shapes. You need to learn option one, square and a square, option three, flying geese, option four, half square triangles. You need to learn those and concentrate on those just like you did in grade school when you learned your multiplication tables. You maybe had little flashcards. I have a little six-year-old grandson. We kept him for a week this summer. He knows his multiplication tables at age six. He's got flashcards. He knows what two times two is. He knows what three times three is. You hold up that flashcard, he knows it. You need to make flashcards. You need to know your options. You need to know option one, how to trim it, what does it look like? You need to know option three, flying geese, how to trim it, what does it look like? And you need to know option four, how to trim it, what does it look like? If you know that, then you're on the road to learning how to do the pattern adapting. The other thing that is imperative, you have to know this. And if you don't know it, then it's gonna be very confusing and frustrating. And this is for anything in the quilt world that you do, not just for square and a square. You need to know the cut size of a piece of fabric and you need to know the sewn size of a piece of fabric. You need to know when you use a cut size and when do you use a sewn size and what is a sewn size and what is a cut size. Because if you don't, then you're not gonna have the right numbers. You may know what a flying goose is and you may be looking at the chart, but the chart is telling you what the cut size is and maybe you're working in your head with a sewn size. So you've got to know the difference and be on the right track of knowing that cut and that sewn size. So while I'm talking about that and emphasizing that, let's look down here and let's talk about it a little bit more. Because as we go through our pattern adapting today, we're gonna to talk about cut size and sewn size. So I think in the quilt world, what is the most confusing, and especially to beginners, is, is that when you look at a block, this is a block, 
The block is finished. I don't have to do anything else to finish this block. But this block is not a finished size. This block still has outside edges that are the raw edges. So this block is a cut size. If I measure this block, it's going to measure eight and a half inches. So that's going to be an eight and a half cut size because it still has raw edges. It is unfinished. Even though the block is finished, it is an unfinished size because it still has raw edges, okay? Now, if this was in a quilt and completely done, then it would be a finished size, okay? So think about this. Even though the block is finished, it is not a sewn or finished size. It still has raw edges. So when you're working with numbers and you're trying to understand, the first thing you need to think to think of is, is that is this the size with raw edges or is this the side with sewn edges? So I don't use the word finished and unfinished. I just, I quit using that word probably 25, 30 years ago because it's too confusing. And if you don't understand completely, then, you know, a novice to an intermediate could totally get thrown off on sizes with that. So when you're using the charts in the book, you need to make sure that you look at the top of the chart and you know what that number is. It's giving you a cut size or it's giving you a sewn size, okay? I only use cut and sewn. I don't use finished and unfinished because that's way too confusing. Let's think about it. This right here is a flying goose and this flying goose is finished. I don't have to do anything else to this flying goose. It is finished, but it still has raw edges on it. It is not a finished size. It is a cut size. It's an unfinished size, okay? So I don't know what else I can say to help get you straightened out on that, but that is imperative that you understand that, where you use it, how you use it, why you use it, okay? So we're gonna get back more into that cut size and that sewn size in a few minutes when we get into some pattern adapting, okay? Any questions so far? All right. So let's look down here at our table, and here is the basic square. This is a nice large one. Um, I don't really enjoy working with ones this size. You know, years ago when I would travel from show to show and, and demo, people would say, oh, that's too little. I don't want to work with that. Well, actually, this size up just a little bit is some are some of the best sizes to work with, okay? So don't let small or large direct you anymore. So let's let's talk about one more thing. When you go to a quilt show, a quilt shop, a quilt guild, or maybe even just online looking at different things on social media, you look at a quilt and you think, oh, that is so beautiful. And then the next thing you start thinking is, do I have the skill to make it? Do I have the ability or the time to make it? So time to make it, skill to make it. Those are the, whether you think about it or not, those are the two things that direct you and dictate on whether you're going to jump out and make that quilt that you saw. So with the square and a square system, it's going to increase your skills and it's going to, it's a fast method. So it's going to give you more time, um, allow you, you know, to get it done quicker in that length of time. Also people look at it and they say, oh, there's a lot of triangles. Look at all of those half square triangles in this beautiful one here, it's just beautiful, but I don't wanna make all those half square triangles, that would take forever. But when you learn the system, you realize that it's gonna go much smoother and much faster. Okay, so here we have our basic square in the middle. We've surrounded it with our strips. Now, when you look at the ruler, most of the time, I always say 90% of the time, you're gonna use the 90 degree angle. Now, this corner here, we're going to do just some basic, uh, simple math for people. Don't get scared. Don't freak out. Um, we're going to make it very simple, very novice for you, okay? Very beginner. Um, maybe you forgot. Maybe you never learned it. But this is a 90-degree angle. And a 90-degree angle is what makes a square. The other thing that makes a square is that all four sides are the same. So you've got 90-degree angles. You have four sides. And all four sides are the same. So no matter what size you're working with, you're going to put the tip of that 90 into the tip or the corner of that center fabric square. And we call this the center square. It's important to learn the vocabulary, the center square, 
the surround strips, you know, and sometimes we even sew around it multiple times. So in this one right here, you can see how we started out with our square in the middle. We sew it one time with the red, just like you see here with my blue eagle. And we trim it up just like I'm going to do it here. And then we went back again with more strips and sew around it. Trim it up with the 90 again. And you get larger triangles and you just keep going around and around. That's actually our option too. So this would be row one, like you see here, of the surround strips. This would be row two of the surround strips. And of course, since we're wanting whole triangles, then the length and the width must get wider every time you sew around. Because this square, when you sew these around, this is smaller. But now that you have these red ones trimmed up, like we're gonna do here, your square gets larger. So of course, the length of what you're covering on the side of the square, and the width, because your triangle's growing, then your surround strips, when you go around again, have to be longer and wider, okay? So here's the 90 right in the tip, black lines right over the seam. Now, anytime you learn something today, I want you to post it on there because I want to know what you've learned. And anything that's an aha more moment, I want you to post it on here so I can see what is your light bulb and what's burning. That's one of the things I love when I teach is I love to see what the students are learning. So here we've gone to the second corner, and you can see how I pushed my 90 in there. My black lines are right over the seam. My grid line should go right through the point, and I'm keeping my block square. Now, when you make your very first cut, if these lines are not lining up nice and neat the way you want to, don't cut that one. Turn it and start with another corner, because whatever you start with is like putting your best foot forward Whatever you start with, you're going to keep your block square with it as you continue to trim and go around. Now, if you have to make a choice, do I keep my lines inside straight or do I keep my square square? If you have to make a choice, once you start cutting, you have to keep these outside square. These in here are where the human element are. This is your cutting and your sewing and your pressing, these seams in here. So once you start cutting, you've got to keep it square on the outside. If these are off a little bit inside, a little bit won't matter. If it's more than an eighth of an inch, then it probably will affect your finished outcome. Okay, so here we are. And I want you to look at how nice and neat and square and true this square in a square is. And that's an option one. This is what we call an option one, square in a square. And you can make these any size you want. Now, my, my option one is complete. It's finished, but it still has a raw edge, so it's a cut size. So let's say the cut size is four. That means when it's completely into the block, no raw edges anywhere, then it would sew down to a three and a half, okay? So that's your option one. Now to trim your flying geese, let's look at what we're gonna do here. And this is your option two. You're just going to take your um, base, your option one, and you're going to sew around it wider strips and trim it the same way with the 90 right in the tip of your new square. See how that always leaves that perfect fourth of an inch? To get this perfect fourth of an inch when you make a square in a square and you're doing it traditional ways of the quilt world, you're going to have to cut a nice square, and then you're going to have to cut even nicer half square, I mean uh, triangles. Then you're going to have to find the perfect middle of that perfect triangle and put it in the perfect middle of your perfect square. And you're going to have to sew a perfect fourth of an inch seam allowance here. And you're going to have to repeat all that perfection on all four sides. And then you hope when you get done that it's smooth and flat and you've got fourth of an inches for your seam allowance all the way around. But, you know, most likely you're going to need more than one of these in the quilt you're making. And so how many times are you going to have to do that? To get that um, perfection. So j even just for option one square and a square, I love it. You can put it in so many different projects and use it so many different ways. We're going to show you multiple ways here um, shortly. Okay, so to make my flying geese, I'm going to cut it in half, but I can't leave that fourth of an inch on these corners here where I'm going to cut it in half because I've got to create a seam allowance in here and I've got to move these points so that when I come back and sew a fourth and a fourth, 
my point is right there where I need it to be. If I just take an option one with this fourth of an inch and cut it in half, when I put my flying geese back in my block, I'm gonna have blunted corners and I don't want that. I want nice sharp corners like you see here for my flying geese. So what I'm gonna do is I have to trim these two corners different. These I'll trim the same with the fourth of an inch, but these two I have to trim different. So let's look at what that is. So here on my ruler, I have um, ripple lines or the same angle lines coming off. There's three on this side and three on this side. This is the 90, and these three are coming off of each side. It's like if you throw, if you throw a rock in a pond and the rock goes in right there, that's the entry point, but then you get these ripple lines as the water goes out. So these are like the ripple lines as they go out. So when I make my trim, I'm going to put my 90 in there, and then we call it the two-step because you're going to step over two lines. Your 90 is already in there, and you're going to go one, two, and you're going to put the tip of the line right there where it falls off the edge of your ruler. You're going to put that right in the tip. This line is going to go right down the seam, and when you come back to that tip, you have a new grid line right here that's going to go through that point. So let's do that. So here's my 90. I pushed it right into that corner. My lines go right over my seam, my grid line through the point, so I know I have a good corner. And now I'm going to two-step it. One, two. And when I do that, I want the tip of the line to be right sharp in that corner. This is going to be a really sharp cut. It's not going to have the fourth of an inch. And when I come back, I see this new grid line right here that shoots through the point. Everything's looking great. I'm going to make my trim. I'm going to go to the opposite side. I'm going to repeat it, put my 90 in. I'm going to step it over. And I'm also going to look to see if it's lining up nice and straight on the outside edge. So it looks like this, sharp, sharp, two-step. Now we're going to put the 90 in, and we're going to leave the fourth. So there, you can see that fourth of an inch off of that point. Opposite side. So it looks like this, and I'm just gonna drag my ruler over to those sharp points. I'm gonna use my horizontal and vertical lines to make sure I'm staying as square as possible. I'm gonna cut it in half, and there I have my two perfect flying geese. So we're going to talk about going in and using these um, in our pattern adapting here shortly, but flying geese are in almost everything that you make, and I love stars. And this was killing me 40 years ago before I learned square and a square. Actually making stars and making flying geese is what pushed me to develop the square and a square system just for my own self so that I could get more perfection and more speed and more accuracy and be able to make stuff any size. I didn't want to be pushed into only certain sizes. So now let's do our half square triangles option four. To, since we're cutting both directions, see like with our flying, with our flying geese, we were only cutting one direction, so we two-stepped right there so that we could cut. But with our half square triangles, we're gonna cut through both directions so that means we need to two-step all four corners so that we can cut and cut and get our half square triangles. So I'm just gonna repeat that process of doing the two-step on all four corners and keeping it square. So you can just keep going around Nice and sharp trim, keep it square. Now if these pieces I trim off are large enough, I save them because they will actually go on the side of a block. So here you can see a little basket where I've got little trim offs that are a good size. These are a little bit small, but I can do that. And look how you can put them on the sides of your square. So here are some here where I've just taken some of my scraps and put them on. And then you'll go back in and trim them up. 
So there is no waste on this. You can just recycle these, put these on a block. Now, of course, for the size that you trim off, you have to have an appropriate size of square for it. And of course, the charts in the book will help you do that. But there's, there's no waste with your trim offs. It's only wasted if you don't use your imagination to go back in and use them. And there's a lot of um, quilts where I take these trim offs. And even when I teach the quilt or write the pattern, I will tell you how um, to do that. For example, since I'm talking about that, let's move over to the beautiful Rolling Star quilt over here, Steve. And um, just to kind of emphasize that, is in this quilt, the Rolling Star, we have an option 11 in the corner here. And this was my, we get all four of those out of an option 11. I'm not going to show you an 11 today. But um, these pieces that we trim off get are kind of are large. So this here is an option 11 also. So in the pattern when we wrote it and when I teach it, I tell you how to take these trim offs and use them in the next step, which is for your border. So you can really, really go back in and recycle your fabric and your scraps and use it when you know the system. So put your nose down in your ruler, down in your book, watch these webinars and these videos and learn the system and you'll learn everything that you need to know that you need that you're going to do in your sewing room. Okay, so I have it trimmed right up to the tip on all four corners. And so now I'm just going to put my ruler right through those sharp points and I'm going to go one direction. And I'm going to be careful, don't want your fabric to wiggle, move. And then I'm going to go through the other. I don't have to, um, I mean, it's just, to me, it's just so simple. There's not any prep work. You just jump in there and start going. And so there are your half square triangles. So, you know, how many times do you want to do a border? But you're like, ugh, I don't want to mess with all that. And look at your pinwheels. So let's see if we can get a pinwheel going. So there is your pinwheel that you can put in the middle. So you've learned option one, option three, option four, and some tips and hints to go around. We've talked about option two. So now let's talk about using them in uh, blocks and in patterns. Do we have any questions before we move along? On the rolling star you talked about earlier, is this going to be a new webinar or will it be in Quilt Club Week? Um, we will do, we will talk about it and show it in Quilt Club Week, but I'm going to do just a video for it. In fact, um, all of our new patriotic quilts that you see up here, we're going to be doing video teaching just for that specific quilt. Um, so we'll have the Rolling Star that you see down there, just an individual teaching on it. We'll have the pineapple here that you see with this one. Um, this one here, Grizzly Mountain. This one here is Thomas's Log Cabin. And then we have um, this one here, which is used as our new Option 41 Snowball. So we have not taught um, on all of these new ones yet, except um, we have taught on the Grizzly Mountain and we have taught on Thomas's Log Cabin, but these other ones we have not. So those are coming. Um, of course, um, our stuff always winds up in premium. Um, I'm not sure yet exactly where these videos will go when we're done with them, but they are future ones coming. So, kind of answered your question, kind of didn't answer your question. Okay. Uh, which size ruler are you using this morning? I'm using the original ruler this morning. If, you're, if you don't have a ruler and you're just getting started, use uh, purchase the original ruler. And it comes with a book that we call the Quick and Easy Book. Um, and it is a great place to get started for people who only um, start out with the ruler. But you're really going to want that reference book that has more. Um, it has all the, it has the options 1 through 17 that are the square options. It has the charts and all of that. This has, um, so you're really going to want that reference book. This is the Quick and Easy. It has five options, 21 blocks, and six patterns. So it's a great place for, to start for people who just, you know, have uh, a limited amount of money that they can spend. 
but if you can get that reference book and save on getting all of that in one shipping then you're going to be uh, better off um, there might be some package deals on the website He's, those two for sure. Yeah, there are some package deals on the website where you can save a few bucks here and there. Now, also, um, um, talking about that is, is that everyone knows how everything is increasing right now. And, of course, the rulers are acrylic. They're plastic. That's a petroleum gas product. If you've been anywhere this summer and had to put gas in your tank, you know that all of that's very expensive. We have not raised the prices on our tools in years and years and years and years and years. Even years ago when gas prices were up again, we did not raise our prices. So um, you're getting a very good uh, value. Um, you uh, you're have not getting an inflated um, value on there. Okay. All right. So let's look at uh, what we want to do. Oh, any other questions? Nope. Nope. Okay. So let's go back to this sewn and cut size. So a cut size is what you need to know when you're cutting out your work. But when you're doing pattern adapting and you're working on building a block or an option, you have to work in the smaller size. You have to work in the sewn or the finished or, what we, or the graph paper size, and that's the smaller size. And then after you know your sizes, then you come back and uh, work with your cut sizes. So if you know that you needed a two inch sewn um, square, wherever you're putting it, um, you know if it's a two inch sewn, it has to be a two and a half cut, okay? So like I said, it's really imperative to know a sewn and a cut and where and when and how you use those, okay? All right. Um, I have a question. I'm going to get this laid out here. Okay. The question is, um, what is the second ruler one should uh, buy? I have the original. Okay. What would be the next thing? Okay. Have Get the original. Get the reference book. If there's another tool that you're getting, um, I don't know because I use all of these pretty equal. Um, the four patch and nine patch are kind of in a little category of their own. So if you're thinking about those, I would maybe get the nine patch because the nine patch has more squares, more seams, more all of that in it. So more human element than a four patch. So if you're thinking about one of those two, maybe the nine patch or the four patch. Um, and then of course the binding tool, if you're finishing your quilts and you're putting bindings on and you want to do those pretty little flanges on it, then of course the binding tool. Um, um, I maybe would go with, just for general, I would maybe do the Grande. Uh, the Grande has so, is so versatile. I would do the original and then the Grande. And um, uh, because you'll be able to use that on so many, it has, it, it's called the Grande Multi-Purpose. It's got so many purposes. And you can watch a video. Uh, doesn't each ruler have a video on the website? It should have, yeah. Yeah, each, if you go to the website, squareandasquare.com, and you go to the products and you see the rulers, you can watch a little video on each one of those. And so that will help you because, you know, Jane over here, she makes a certain type of quilts and these tools would fit her uh, personality better of what she likes to make and then you know Tammy over here she likes certain quilts and maybe the the nine patch ruler is more of what she would use so some of it has to do with what you enjoy doing in your sewing room or what you want to make Can in your sewing room and and someone said get them all we do have a get it all don't we Oh, well, we do have a get it all. yeah you can go to the website and we do have a get it all where you can save um, a pretty penny on that I don't know what it is or how many of the products are in it, but it's a go look at it. Get it all. It's a bunch. Yeah, life is short. I eat, want it all. Eat dessert first, yeah. you know? Okay, so let's look here at putting, um, let's put four little flying geese together. And I have purposely picked these out that have the dark um, center. So now let's look at four little flying geese because so much is about color and contrast. You want to think about what that block is doing and how you want the color and the contrast. So obviously when you look at this one, there's more of a contrast. And anytime you're making a star, it's imperative that your points are dominant. Because if those points are not dominant, people are not going to see a star. So when you look at this one, to me the first thing I see is this pink. 
and then I see the points of the star. So here we have um, two different little versions of that. So let's talk about putting um, an option one in the middle. So you could put a plain square in the middle or you could put an option one in the middle. You can make these uh, different colors or you can make them so that they show up and that they're similar colors. So for example, on this one, see how if I used See, if I made these points, this, these strips the same as these strips, then you can see how that changes it up a little bit. That makes a really bold star to where if you used a different color point, it's going to look a little different. Okay. Now, I want you to look at this and see what happens, and the only thing we're going to do is we're just going to flip it and put it together like this. And then of course you can put anything in your corners. And whether you use a light or a dark, it's going to make that look different or a medium. Okay. Now let's look at this one where we have um, kind of a, a darker in the center instead of the light. So what would happen if we put, um, let's put some half square triangles in the corner and since this is the bright orange, let's do the bright orange on the outside. and that gives you one look or if you want them on the inside and let's flip these back out to be stars so when you're looking at this there's actually um, three I'm gonna say components of this block you have squares in the corner which can be anything whether they're plain squares or half square triangles and you can do their colors all different. So you can use plain squares or half square triangles. You can use flying geese so that they make points of a star or you can do it so they make more of a square in a square look where you're just going around and around. You can use plain squares in the middle. You can use option ones in the middle. And what would happen if we use these to make a pinwheel in the middle. And do you want your colors to match up like you see here or to be different? And then as you do the pinwheel, do you want to keep triangles in the corner? Do you like the orange going in with the orange? Would you want to flip it? and put the orange out. So your contrast of your lights and darks and whether you put points in or points out change the look of all of that. Okay. Now before we move on to figuring sizes for this I want to look at this quilt here. Now this quilt was all made from doing basically what I've been doing down there on the table. So here you can see plain square, plain rectangle, and half square triangles in the corner. And you get this kind of little fat churn dash looking block. Here you can see where we have our flying geese, we have our half square triangles in the corner, and then we did the pinwheel star, the pinwheel part in the middle. This one is really cool with color. We did the option one in the middle. We did the flying geese with, um, so that it would not be a star. And we used half square triangles. And notice how we kept this dark together and how you get this banded look going around. Now 
This one looks like you started out with a square here and just went around it with strips. But this is your option one in the middle, just like you have an option one here. Here we have the long side of the flying goose coming in, just like we have the long side of the flying goose coming in here. And then we just did a plain square in the corner. So these are the same. It's just color that gives you the two different looks, just color placement. Here you can see the simple star, just the plain square in the middle, simple flying geese on the outside edge, and plain square in the corner. Here is um, an option one in the middle, star points, half square triangles, point going out. Now when you do the dark point going out on a star, it's going to give your star a rounded look. And so as you set these together, you can get some really beautiful looks to where this star looks very rounded. This one I love because you can see how we've kept the points matching and it really gives you a beautiful star look. Um, it almost looks kind of like this part. You can see that star coming out and then you can see the eight pointed star. So plain squares in the corner, flying geese, and then the four half square triangles to make a pinwheel. This one actually looks a lot like an option two where we started with our square. So around one time trim it up, two time trim it up, three times trim it up, but it's very similar to this one and this one. Plain squares in the corner, dark side in, see this had the light side in, and then an option one with light. See this was our option one with light strips. So all of these different blocks are just these components that I've shown you and look at all the different all the different blocks you can get, all with just those components. So now let's talk about charts and sizes. Now when you're working on building a block, you have to work with the smaller number, the sewn, finished, or graph paper. And when you look at one of our blocks like you have here. Let's just lay this one out. Uh, let's just do it like this. I don't want you to get lost in all the pieces. Okay, so when you look at a block, when you look at a block, any block, you have to decide is this block a nine patch block, meaning that you're going to have nine squares that are basically the same size and you can do anything inside of those squares. So when you look at your block you have to decide is this block put together in a nine patch fashion or is the block put together in a four patch fashion. So a four patch means that see how you have three equal squares going across and down so in a four patch block, you would have four equal squares going across and down. So we're gonna divide it through the middle and then we're gonna do it one more time. So when I look at this block, I see one, two, three, four. So this is gonna be done in a four patch setting. This one would be done in a nine patch setting. So let's write nine patch. and four patch. <laughs> but we're looking at rows. How many rows across? How many rows down? How many row, how many uh, square, I'm sorry, how many squares across? How many squares down? How many squares across? How many squares down? That's the first thing you have to do when you're looking at a block that you want to make. These are called nine patches. These are for, called four patches. Now, of course, inside these squares, you can do anything. You can leave it a plain square. You can turn it into a half square triangle. You can turn it into an option one. You can turn it into a, a flying goose and have a rectangle next to it. So see how you can do anything inside of these squares. But the first thing you do is you have to figure out is it a nine patch or a four patch. And that's important because the next thing we do is our sizing and that's really important. So if these are all gonna be the equal 
size, and we want this to be a 12 inch block. And of course we're working in this sewn finish size, so that means it would go up to a 12 and a half when you're looking at it with the cut edges. But to figure it, you have to work in this smaller sewn finished or graph paper size. So if this block is 12, and we're gonna put three units inside of it, three into 12 is four, so that tells us that each one of these is a, um, that four you can't see very good, is a four inch sewn. And I like to put an S or a C by my numbers when I'm working. So I know is this a sewn size or a cut size when I look at it. So if these are four, this is four, four plus four is eight, plus another four makes it 12. So that's gonna give me my 12 inches going across. And inside here, I can do anything I want. So if I want an option one, then I know that I want a four inch sewn option one. So that's when you're just gonna to go to your book. So you're gonna to go to your square and square book and the charts start in on page 32. I'm sorry, 34. So I'm gonna to go to my, uh, my reference book here. I'm gonna find option one. I want option one, so here's option one. And when I look at the top of my charts, it says sewn or finished size. So what it's saying is, what is the sewn or finished size of your option one that you want? Well, it's a four inch, so I'm gonna come down here and find my four inch, and I'm gonna move across horizontally and it's gonna tell me what size to cut my center square. Because you need to know what size do I cut this so that when I get it trimmed up, it fits into here the way I want it to, okay? So when I look at my chart uh, for that four inch, it tells me that my center square, and up at the top it says cut, is three and three eighths, and so I'm gonna put a C there, that way I know that's a cut size. And then it tells me that my strips I sew around it are one and seven eighths. Now, if it tells you on the center square, if it says three eighths, you gotta cut it three eighths because that center square is what starts out getting your, your work to the size that you're looking for. But on these strips, we put the ruler on there and we trim off what we don't need. So, you know, if you've ever made a pie, you know you make your pie crust a little bigger, put it in there, trim it up, and you have these little pieces that come off. So, you know, you can, if you don't, what I'm saying is, is that if you don't want to cut a seven eighths, I don't want to cut a seven eighths if I don't have to. So I'm going to butt my strip size up to two inches. So I'm going to put a two and a C. That, that tells me that the width of my strips that I put around my square are two inches. So that's how easy that is to figure that um, option one right there in the middle, okay? Now let's look at um, flying geese. Let's say that I wanted to put a flying goose um, right here in this block. So I, once again, you've got to work with your sewn numbers. So I know that that's a four inch um, sewn. And so a flying goose is what we call a perfect rectangle. So when you're working with the sewn measurement, is this still in the picture good? Yeah, okay. So when you're working with the sewn measurement, your rectangle is a perfect rectangle. So what that means that if this is two and you double it, then that's four. If this side is three, you double it and that side is six and that's a sewn measurement, okay? Because a, a flying goose is a perfect rectangle. And so what a perfect rectangle means is if I cut it in half, I would have a two inch square and a two inch square. So look over here at this one. If this one we wanted to be a flying goose in those two spots, see how a flying goose can go in there. Because the square has the 90, when you divide it like this, it's the 45, which makes it the, the perfect shape and the perfect unit. So you can put a flying goose in where two squares are. And um, whatever the short side is, that's what the long side is. Everybody wants to call that a 16 pass. <laughs> if because, you are only sewing, yeah, we're doing pattern adapting. 
And when you do pattern adapting, you have to decide how many across and how many down. That's all you need to do. Um, so this is not a 16. If I was just going to take little squares and put them together, boom, 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 just all little squares, then yes, it's a four patch, a four patch, a four patch, a four, four patch, which makes a 16 patch. But with pattern adapting, there's not a 16 patch pattern. They're either nine patch patterns or four patch patterns. That's it. That's all there is. There's not. So when you're doing pattern adapting, this is a four patch pattern because it doesn't really matter what's happening in here. I need to know how many crossed and how many down to get my numbers to work with. Okay, so perfect rectangle for flying goose. So if this is a two, this is a four. So if someone emails me or texts me and they tell me that they have a sewn, they say, I need a flying goose. And my sewn size that I need is a two and a half by a four and a half. I automatically know that this number that they've given me is not a sewn size. Because if I see how it's perfect, if it's two, you double if it's four. If it's three, you double if it's six. So if this short side is two and a half and I double it, that makes this side over here five and a half. So I know right here when they email me and they've given me that this is a sewn, I know that's not correct. I know that it's a two by four sewn that they're looking for. And that right there is the number one email and the number one issue with pattern adapting. That's what we get the most, most emails on is what size of flying goose do I get? They tell me they have a sewn size that's two and a half by four and a half. So if you look at this flying goose right here, the flying goose is sewn, but it's not a sewn size. It still has raw edges on it. So for example, this would have to be a two and a half by four and a half with this raw edge and it would sew down to the sewn measurement in a block, completely done, a two by four, okay? So that's, that's, that's pretty much it, and then you just go to your charts when you know what sizes these are, however you're working them together, and uh, do it. So let's do, uh, let's do some half square triangles in here for a uh, pinwheel. Okay, so if I know that, let's say that this is a 12 inch sewn, and I'm gonna put four into it, four into 12 is three, so that tells me that this is gonna be a three inch sewn, a three inch sewn, a three inch sewn, and a three inch sewn. So if this is a three inch sewn, then I know that for a flying goose, this is gonna be a three, by six because it's a three and a three. So this is a three by six. So I would use my chart and come over here and find my sewn size on my option three. It happens to be the one at the very bottom, a three by six, and it would tell you your sizes. So uh, my center square is five and an eighth cut, and I'm gonna do a three inch cut there. It says two and seven eighths, but I'm gonna bump it up. Um, and if I want half square triangles, I know this is a two inch sewn square so i just come to my option four chart and it says what's the sewn size you're looking for there's my two inch and i move across and it tells me my center square size and my strips okay so that's it pretty much in a nutshell so the when you're doing your pattern adapting you need to learn your options options one three and four you need to know the difference in a sewn and a cut size and you need to know how to break the block down to is it a three patch, is it a four patch. Um, there are other blocks that are different than a three patch and a nine patch, but most everything, the general, uh, most common is gonna fit into the, the nine patch or the 12 patch um, on the blocks. And then probably the other thing that people struggle with is color and the main thing I can tell you about when you're choosing your fabrics is that you want contrast. Whatever you want to jump out in your block, you need to make sure that the pieces that are sewn next to it have contrast. And when you put, um, um, when I think about color and fabrics and how they work together, um, fabrics are very much what I call human characteristics. So think about if you have Jimmy, who's a great little boy, you never have any problems with him, 
But if he comes over here and plays with Bobby, then there's, there's conflict. Jimmy and Bobby don't play well together. So it could be that Jimmy's fine all by himself and Bobby's fine all by himself, but the two together just don't mix. But if you put Jimmy over here with Carl, well, those two may play together just fine. So, you know, the different colors are going to react different, just like different personalities and different people react differently when they come together. And so you want the positive qualities of both of those fabrics to come out and play well together when you put them in the same block, in the same room, same table or whatever to play with. So hopefully that helps too, is to think about your contrast. And even though this pink is a light, you know, depending on what you put it next to, it may turn into a medium. Um, it may turn into a dark. So think about when you, when you mix them together, what's actually happening. Okay. All right. Do we have some questions, Steve? Um, I'm not sure. On my rulers, it doesn't show an eighth or a three-eighths. I'm not sure what they're wanting. Okay, the only time that we use um, like an eighth or a three eighths, the only time that you need to see that number on your ruler is actually when you're cutting a size. So you're um, cutting um, a square or a strip. When you're trimming your block up, you're just looking at lines. You're not looking at numbers. You're just going to take your 90 and put it in there. So on your original rulers, uh, on your original, on your uh, mini, um, and on your grande, if you're just trimming, you don't need a three-eighths or an eighth or a five-eighths or whatever. The only time you need that is when you're actually cutting a square or a strip, okay? So when I look at, um, let's see if this looks good here without a glare. Okay, right here's a good place without a glare. So when you're looking at the grande, we don't have the numbers 3 eighths or 1 eighth on there, but we have the lines for the markings on there. So you need to learn. If you're going to do quilting, you need to learn, like if this is a 1 inch area on your ruler, you need to learn that this is a half. You need to learn that that's a fourth. You need to learn three-fourths, and then in between those are your eighths. So that's a one-eighth, that's a two-eighth. I just saw a post on Facebook just this morning, and it said that, you know, you need to teach your kids, you know, how to look at a ruler and look at an eighth or a sixteenth or whatever. You really, really need to do this. So if you're not familiar or if this is hard for you, then you, you need to take some time to study it so that you know what an eighth is and you know what a, a three eighths is and stuff. Okay? All right. Another question? I don't think so. Okay. And so here is uh, on the grande what it looks like. You've got your marks. And then here on the, the mini, um, these, uh, we're not really using this part of it for um, anything that you would need eighth inch markings. But when you look here at the um, the corner square, you see the one inch, and then you can see the fourth of an inch ones are kind of bold, and then the eighth of an inch ones are those little ones in between. Okay? All right. Another question? No. No? Okay. So let's look. Let's kind of, um, any time that you are studying something that is difficult for you or that you um, are, are learning large amounts of, and volume of information, it is, it is hard on your brain. It is tiring on your brain. Your brain actually uses more chemicals than your muscles do. When you're thinking, that's your brain doing cardio and working out. Just like if you were doing jumping jacks or running or on a treadmill, your muscles are working and you get tired and you need to rest. When you're learning high volumes of information, your brain needs to rest. It's actually burning more calories doing that thinking than your muscles are in your physical part of your body when you're exercising or working out. So, you know, to, to add more to what I've taught today, you know, it might just kind of go over the top because once your brain gets full, it needs time to rest and sort and think about 
all of those different things you've learned and to put them into practice before you can pile more knowledge on top of that. So when I get through teaching and I've been doing this and working with all these numbers and thinking about what I'm doing and thinking about how it's presented, my brain is tired. So I know when my brain is tired that I really can't teach anymore. Uh, uh, I'm not going to teach it as well and I know my students aren't going to soak it up as much. So um, there's more that we could go on and do, but I think let's kind of let our brain rest. It's kind of like when you're doing a taste test, you need to let your palate kind of get that taste off of it and get a new, a new uh, plain taste. Or even when you're snipping things, you want to kind of clear out your, your smell so that you can actually smell what you're smelling. So let's look at some of these quilts up here and let's break down what we've used for them. And um, uh, with it being summer, we always think about from Memorial Day to Labor Day being summer, being patriotic, being, you know, we have Memorial Day, which is where we think about our fallen soldiers. We have um, Fourth of July, which is a celebration of the freedom of our country. And then, of course, we have Labor Day, uh, which is a day of rest for all the laborers that helped build our country. And so all of that's kind of red, white, and blue, all of your summer decorations and everything. So we have a line of patriotic fabric. Um, in 2026, America will be 250 years old. So we have our eagle flags, which are down here in the Rolling Star. And this is our eagle flag fabric. You can see that it comes in a red, and it comes in a blue, and then it comes in the, the lighter, the cream. And this one is fussy cut to fit this four and a half inch. But let's look at it down here on this one. And this quilt uses our snowball block, which is option uh, 41. So this one is option 41. We do have the kits available for it. And the kits come with your option 41. And it comes with um, three sheets of uh, pattern three pages for a pattern that helps you with your color placement and sizes and everything for uh, this particular quilt. But you can see here how we say um, 1776, 2026, and then 250. So this is the one that actually celebrates our 250 years. And then we've kind of fussy cut this little uh, star out to go up here in the corners of our border. And then the way that the fabric is printed, you actually have two rows of stars that are real close together here when you look at the whole sheet of fabric. And we've uh, fussy cut those to be our border. So I think this one's really pretty. And then you can see that this has got a little bit of a flag in it. It's called our Tone on Tones. Of course, it comes in the red, the cream, the blue, a black, and a green. And then these are our everyday checks. And so those are great to have. They they blend with all of our fabrics um, always. So back over here at the Rolling Star, this is our red black check. This is our cream or what we call dirt flag tone on tone. And then our eagle flags. And this one is a nine patch block. So you're going to have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then what you put inside of it is what helps to create the design. This is the option one and this is the option 11. So plain square, option 11, option one, you've got your rolling star. Once you learn all these different units for the square and the square system, every quilt just becomes so simple and easy to make. Now this one is our pineapple and all of these we have on the website. You can order the patterns or you can get the kits. And this one we kitted in multiple sizes. So if you want a king or a queen or whatever, you can get it. Um, and this is an option 12 is the pineapple. So see how the, the width of the strips, they don't get wider and that's how you do this. You just start with your square and keep going around and around. If you go to YouTube or the Facebook area, you can watch a video on the pineapple from I think September of 19. Uh, for those of you that are interested, it's very, very easy and fun to do. Then this one is from the Grizzly Mountain pattern but because we've used our eagle fabric, we call it Eagle Mountain. And you can see our flying geese here. And then here we have our half square triangles. So this one is not difficult or hard to make. We've just, you're just gonna make a lot of flying geese and a lot of half square triangles. And they're gonna be very neat and clean and precise and easy to go together in your block. Now this one is actually a um, form of a nine patch because this is one section, this is one section, this is one section. 
So you're going to have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, but they're not all the same size. So this is still broke down into a nine patch setting, but each section is not the same size. The four corners, of course, are, but the section that you're going to put through the middle of your block is smaller than um, in the width than your corners, okay? All right, and then this one is Thomas's Log Cabin. Beautiful, beautiful quilt. We've done it in so many different colors over the years, and I really love it in the red, white, and blue. So we just did um, four log cabins and put them together for the center, and then surrounded it with the um, half square triangles. Um, we did do a flying goose here um, to help switch the uh, triangle units going in opposite directions. And then we have the one on the table here, which is our um, Eagle Snowball, and that uses our new Option 41. So the same tool, same ruler, makes um, all of this, whether you're using the Grande or the original, <coughs> um, or the Mini, okay? All right, do we have any questions from anyone? Uh, well, it says, can you round up your middle block? Not sure what that is. Whatever. She said, can you round up your middle block? So um, with the vocabulary she used, I'm not sure exactly what she means, but let's go over how you do it. This is your basic square. Whatever you're putting in the middle here has to be exactly. You cannot do any rounding up or rounding down, or it's going to change the size of your option one or of your flying geese or whatever. So if I say cut three and three eighths or two and seven eighths, you have to cut it exact. Now on the width of the strips, you can bump up. If the chart says one and seven eighths, cut them two. That's much easier. Because see, when you put the ruler on here to trim it off, you're trimming off what you don't need. So it's not gonna affect your size. But the center, keep it exact. Don't change it because that will affect your size. And I have a feeling that's probably what you were talking about. Okay, any other questions before we close out for today? Okay, so before we finish up, I want to remind you about Quilt Club Week. Quilt Club Week, for those of you that are brand new, it's a, like, um, if you went to a quilt show, what do you do? You, you set aside a certain amount of time, and you go to look to get inspired and motivated, maybe take a class and learn a new skill, and just to see, to be, um, everything around you, to all be quilting, and for it to be fun and exciting and motivational, for you to learn new skills and to get new knowledge to up your game in the quilting, in your piecing and in your quilting. So that's what a quilt show is all about and that's what Quilt Club Week is all about. It's a specific time, it's the first week of October. So like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we're gonna do a little preliminary warm-ups. Wednesday, we're gonna start off with our early bird that night. And then all day Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday, there will be classes, demos, lectures, tips and hints on all kinds of different things that you'll see. Um, and of course, if and there'll be full classes. So the cool thing is, is that when you go to a quilt show, you go and when you leave, the experience is over. You don't have access to your teacher. You don't have access to your vendor. You don't have access to see that over again. It's like, man, I wish I'd gone back by and see watched at that one vendor's booth, she was doing whatever, I wished I could see that again. When we do our Quilt Club Week, and it's all online, and it's all of these videos, we do live stuff and we do pre-recorded stuff, um, you get to go back in and watch it over again. You get to watch it over and over again and experience that and learn that and see exactly how to do it. And then of course, when Quilt Club Week is over, you still have access to me and the teachers that I had there during Quilt Club Week. So we did Quilt Club Week in 2020, and the pandemic actually really pushed me to come up with this idea and to do it because, of course, we were all in lockdown at home, and we weren't doing any quilt shows and not getting that motivation and having that fun. And um, so we did it 2020. Everyone loved it, so we did another one in 2021, and now this one will be our third one of 2022. So the cool thing about all of those being videoed and recorded is, is you can still go back and learn and have the fun and the motivation and the experience of 2020 and 2021. And those are available now on our website. So you can go in and sign up for Quilt Club Week. You can watch 2020, you can watch 2021. And then when our 22 starts, 
the first week of October, you'll be ready to go and ready to learn for that one. We've been working all summer on doing our videos, getting our classes and our projects, and all of the fun and motivation put together for you for Quilt Club Week. So go in and do that. Now, if you are a Premium Club member or you want to become a Premium Club member, you can also go to the website and you can sign up for Premium Club. Everything we do, all of these webinars like I did today, all of Quilt Club Week and other uh, what I'm going to call semester classes, other projects that we do, all of those things are in Premium Club. So you don't have to purchase Quilt Club Week um, extra or separate or anything. So um, if you can, Premium Club is obviously the best choice, but if you want to just get started and kind of see what we're all about, Quilt Club Week is an exciting and fun thing to do. Now, with our Quilt Club Week, we also have a private Quilt Club Week Facebook page. And then with our Premium Club, we have a private Facebook page with it where you can interact with other people and see what they're doing and uh, continue to stay motivated and excited and have that friendship with people. Now, something about Quilt Club Week that others did um, that we found out about is, is that a sister in California watched Quilt Club Week during the pandemic while as her sister in Canada was watching Quilt Club Week during the pandemic, they could um, FaceTime together as they were watching the, and they could experience the class or the lecture together just like if you were there in person. So I really love that, that we weren't separated. You know, we, we've lost so much with the pandemic and being separated from people and it was a way to help bring people together, give them something fun and exciting to do and to look forward to and it was such a wonderful hit we've decided to continue on with that I want to um, um, just some you know little text messages and emails and stuff that we get um, this one came from a lady who joined premium club and she said I've been quilting for many years and while I'm not a master quilter what oh um, um, I've been quilting for many years, and while I'm not a master quilter, I don't consider myself a beginner. I must say this method has helped me produce the most accurate nine patches, four patches, and triangle units that I have ever made. I could never get my seams to line up so accurately, so easy as well. Thank you, Jody and Steve, for your videos and your great tools, techniques, and rulers. I'm looking forward to starting my next quilt, and I can't wait for Quilt Club Week next year. So that was a, a fun one. And then this one was about the shortcut binding tool. It says, the shortcut binding tool is great. I am sad I didn't buy it sooner. Um, never again will I pay someone to um, have to put my binding on. Um, um, this one says, Jody, I just want to tell you that I've learned more from you in the last six months than I have in 20 years of quilting. Your videos are the difference. Without them, I would never have tackled some of the quilting projects that are now finished and my family is loving to use. And I love that part because when you make a quilt, you are putting so much of yourself and your love into it and you're thinking about that person that you're making it for and now they're getting to enjoy that and express that. And sometimes you're not always there to give them a hug and to encourage them, but they can wrap up in that quilt and let that let your love hug them from far away. She says, I'm now finished um, and I'm ready to start another project with the square and a square. So just some great um, testimonies there from people who are not only using the square and a square, but also a part of Quilt Club Week and Premium. So I always say that when you learn the science of patchwork and you learn the square and a square system, you up your game, you become the piecer that you've always dreamed of. Remember our text number is 817 713 2879, you never have to be stranded or without a teacher or not know what you're supposed to do. Just give us a holler and we'll help you get moving right along that patchwork path. I hope you've enjoyed it today. I hope you go in, uh, in sign up um, on our website for Premium Club and, and Quilt Club Week. And also you can go in there and sign up to watch the free webinars that we have done over the last two years. Lots of good and fun motivational things to do. Uh, it's kind of cooled off here in Texas today. It's been super, super hot. I hope you're enjoying your summer and getting some great sewing done. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.